Over the years, we have heard a great deal about the fact that God is in the process of preparing a people that can be used by Jesus Christ in establishing and ruling in his kingdom on this earth during the millennium. I propose over the next several months, probably even years, that every Sabbath my motivation when I stand up here before you is to help prepare you for your service under Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. Now, there are going to be times when God's word is going to be pretty specific, very specific about what God expects of us. You've heard of the sermons given about the hard sayings of Jesus Christ. And some of them are hard. They're hard for us humanly, physically to do. But you see, God has laid out a plan, a plan of salvation that we go through every year in his festivals. They contain, every one of them, contain teachings within them that pertains to some aspect of God's work in preparing his people. We know from Psalm 74, 12, it says, God is working salvation in all the earth. His holy days give us the pattern of what he is doing, what he is working out step by step from Passover all the way through to the last great day. We have no doubt where we start and where we're going to end by knowing the meaning found in God's holy days, his festivals. Now, God has a reason for offering us salvation. He's doing it for a very great purpose. We know in an overall sense that great purpose is that he is going to establish his kingdom over this earth that's going to be governed by Jesus Christ and his saints for a thousand years, called the millennium. And we can know that because that's what God is aiming for, that he is preparing for that event. We know he's following a plan that he has outlined in these holy days, in these festivals. We also know that Jesus Christ said in John 14, he says, I go and prepare a place for you, for each of us personally. That's how it's presented to us. He is preparing a specific personal place for each and every one of us in his kingdom. So not only is he preparing in an overall sense for the establishment of his kingdom, he is following a plan for each and every one of us as well in order that we are prepared. God is able, and he knows what he wants, and he knows how he is going to get it. He's preparing for that. And he is faithfully following a plan that he laid out, that he established from the very beginning. Now, since we know these things, we've heard them, we've been taught them for years, we have to ask ourselves, am I following God's purpose in preparing for the establishment of that kingdom on the earth? Am I personally doing that? Now, if you project yourself forward to the kingdom of God, I don't know if you've, any of you have put your mind to that, to the millennium, what do you picture yourself doing? Do you ever think about that? Are you consciously preparing for what you may envision that will be in the kingdom? 
Or do you find that the kingdom of God is not very real in your mind, in your heart? You just can't quite grasp what you and that kingdom have in common. Are we yielding to the one who is preparing us for that time? Do we have a clear picture of what God is preparing us for? We need to know. We should know. How do we know we're in, in tune with what God is doing if we don't know what God is preparing us for? When we think of God's kingdom ruling on this earth for the period of the millennium, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, I think most of us think in terms of what? Rulership, right? That's what we think of. We tend to think of the kingdom of God's, God in terms of governing, of ruling. We may think in terms of the parable of the talents. When we are given cities over which to rule, we think of Jesus Christ saying in Revelation 2.26, what he just said and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him I will give power over the nations Revelation 3 21 says to him who overcomes I will grant to sit with me on my throne are these not all pictures in our mind of rulership of governing sure they are well let's go to Revelation chapter 5 Revelation 5, one scripture that's going to tell us what God is preparing us for. Revelation 5 and verse 10. Let's read this one verse. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, just think for a minute about this one scripture and what it's telling us. It says we're going to be kings. Now, kings symbolize what? Rulership, governing. But it also says that we are going to be priests. Are you and I actively preparing to be a priest? What comes to your mind when you think about that? We can think about ruling. We can think about sitting on a throne and having authority over people. But what do we think about when we're talking about being a priest? Well, I'm afraid that sometimes this aspect of what God is preparing us for gets overshadowed by our being prepared to be a ruler for rulership. But the verse says we are going to be kings and priests. So we have to ask ourselves, are we consciously, actively preparing to be a priest? Again, what's that mean to you? What thoughts come to your mind when you think down that road? Well, some people say, well, we don't have priests in the church today. We have ministers. And that's true. But this verse is still applicable, just as much today as it was then. Ministers still have to apply what we are to be prepared for in the church now. There are other New Testament verses that have to do with our being a priest as well. Let's look at a couple. We're in Revelation. Let's go back a page or two to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2. In fact, we'll read two of them here in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2. In verse 9, he says, notice what God is saying about you and about me. Verse 9, but you are a chosen generation. Again, we're not here because we chose, we were chosen to be here. He said, a royal, notice, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and I hope we're getting a grasp, at least some, of what God means when he calls something holy and what it should mean to us. 
We're going to hear more about that as time goes forward. It says, we're his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him. As Mr. Nettle said, it's not about us, it's about God. Call him uh, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Notice it says, we are, present tense, we are right now a royal priesthood. Do you think of yourself that way? God says you are. You see, God looks at us, and he calls us now what we will fully be in the future. But he says we are now a royal priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. He says, You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy, a holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices. Pay attention to these words because we'll be hearing them again. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This verse says that for the very reason this that the very reason we have been called is to be a royal priesthood. And it says we are to be offering up spiritual sacrifices. What this means is that even now, right now today, you and I have priestly responsibilities. It's not something that's just for the future. It is just as important now for us to be learning to be a priest as it is for us to learn to rule properly. If we're not practicing being a priest right now, we're not going to be prepared. Every one of us knows that we have to practice ruling according to God's way right now in our lives. We also have to practice being a priest right now according to what God desires in a priest. What does a priest do? What kind of functions does a priest perform? Is there any possibility that what we see in the functions of a priesthood under the old covenant, maybe it gives us some indication of what we'll be doing as priests now and in the kingdom of God. Remember 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 10 verse 11 says that those things that happened to Israel were an example. They were written down for our instruction. We're supposed to be learning from them. Now, we all know that priest offers up sacrifices to God. I think we all agree we can read the scriptures in the Old Testament and see that. But is there more to it than that? We can learn a great deal from the arrangement of the various courts around the temple in ancient Israel. The, 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 the uh, temple that Solomon built and later Herod rebuilt. Some of you have spoken about that temple and brought out various features about it. So we're familiar with that temple. We're familiar somewhat with how it was constructed. We're familiar somewhat with how it functioned in the nation of Israel under God's direction. But we, what we want to look at is the temple at Jerusalem and the priesthood as they interacted with those coming to the temple. Now, this was a very complex procedure that people went through that, you know, the scriptures actually tell us, and especially Jewish history, history points out. You see, everything they did followed certain directions, certain guidelines, certain rules. Why? Because God does everything decently and in order. There was no confusion. When you went to the temple, you followed exactly the guidelines, the rules that God established in that temple for wor temple worship. I'm going to simplify this because it gets pretty complicated. 
but I think I can make it so we can understand it. If you were an Israelite man, when approaching the temple of God in Jerusalem, you had a certain path, you had certain procedures that you would have to follow. Coming to sacrifice and worship at the temple required that the person strictly adhere to certain customs and certain rules, certain rituals. The design of the temple, as it was instructed by God to be built, had a great deal of symbolism wrapped up in its construction. It's an interesting subject, by the way, if you haven't looked at that. It's, a, it's amazing, and you start looking at the symbols, and you apply them to God's overall plan for mankind. It's, it's really an amazing thing to start looking at. Well, the first thing that an Israelite man would come to in, in approaching the temple would be what is called the court of the Gentiles. This was the outermost courtyard that extended all the way around the temple. As the name implies, it was only accessible to Gentiles, to foreigners, to anyone that was considered impure. They could not come any closer to the temple than that outer courtyard that surrounded the temple. That's the only place they were allowed to go. But the Israelite man, he could pass through the court of the Gentiles. In fact, he had to go through the court of the Gentiles. It's an interesting thing to think about. He had to go through there to get to the temple. I think you can draw some analogy from that if you want to. There was no other way that he could get close to the temple without going through the court of the Gentiles. Inside of the court of the Gentiles was the court of women. In this case, if you were an Israelite woman, you could go through the court of the Gentiles. You had to go through that. And you could proceed from there into the court of women. Now, an Israelite man could go through and into the court of women but neither the man nor the woman could proceed beyond these two courts. Because inside that court was the court of the priest. In order to proceed into the court of the priest, you had to be a priest. Now, a priest, in carrying out his responsibilities, he was actually allowed to go up to that area just outside the temple proper. If he was on duty then, he could actually go inside the temple into the holy place. But he could only go there if he was carrying out his responsibilities at that time. Now the high priest, as we know on the Day of Atonement, had the responsibility and the privilege of traveling through the holy place into the Holy of Holies to make his offering before God. So under the Levitical priesthood, the average person did not have access to God at all under that sacrificial system. How does that apply to us today since each of us individually have direct access to God? Well, it illustrates something about the responsibility of the priest to help us understand a very important aspect of what you and I are going to be doing in our future role as priest. Think about the example of the priesthood serving at the temple and our responsibilities as priest in God's kingdom. It's an important concept for us to grasp. Once the Israelite reached the court of women, he then had to call upon a priest to represent him before God. The priest then functioned in that position. We see the term mediating. We see the term mediator appearing a number of times in the scriptures. And that's what a, a priest did. He mediated between the Israelite and God under that sacrificial system of worship. Under this system, a priest had access to God in a way that other people did not have. 
Now, because he had access to God, we understand that the priest served God in a personal capacity. Think of this in relation to our, our role in the world tomorrow. Think about that, but think about it also as we'll see our role today. Remember, you are a royal priesthood right now, today. We see that the priest ministers to others. The priest was ministering to the average Israelite, and as such, we could say he was representing the Israelite before God when he offered the sacrifice on the altar. This is how that system worked in ancient Israel. Now, we'll see these things more specifically in a minute. But more importantly, we'll see how there are practical applications of these very functions for us today. But before we do that, we're going to look ahead a bit. We're going to look into the millennium through a couple of scriptures to help us get an indication of our need to get prepared for this function that you and I are going to perform in the millennium. Let's go to Numbers chapter 29. Numbers 29. Now, Numbers 28 and 29, we find listed the sacrifices, the offerings that God commanded Israel to do. I want to go to chapter 29, verses 12 and 13. These are talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the festivals when offerings were made. Verse 12, on the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. You shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days, Feast of Tabernacles. You shall present a burnt offering, an offering made by fire as a sweet aroma to the Lord. And notice, 13 young bulls, two rams, 14 lambs in their first year. They shall be without blemish. Their grain offering shall be fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for each of the 13 bulls, two-tenths for each of the two rams, and one-tenth for each of the 14 lambs. Also, one kid of the goats as a sin offering, besides the regular burn offering, its grain offering, and its drink offering. Then it goes on to day two. Same amount, except one of the uh, bulls is decreased in number. It goes to 12. The next day, 11. The next day, 10, and so forth. Now, what this is telling us, and these were typical of all the holy days. They had offerings of sacrifices, sacrificial animals, grain offerings, water offerings on every one of the holy days. So all of these were the same as they were here for the Feast of Tabernacles, except for one thing. And that is the number of sacrifices that were required. <clears throat> now, the Feast of Tabernacles, I think we all agree, is a type, it's a symbol of the millennium, of the rule of God on this earth. What you may have not noticed is that the Feast of Tabernacles has more sacrifices required than all the other holy days combined. If you want to count them, you'll find it's probably about twice as many for that one festival than all the others combined. Since the Feast of Tabernacles represents a millennium and the priest is a representation of what we do and a priest's major responsibility is to make offerings on behalf of the people before God, I think this may give us a kind of picture of how big our responsibility is going to be in the world tomorrow during the millennium over twice the offerings of all the other holy days combined. More than any other time in God's plan is going to happen during the, during the millennium. Now, 
physically, the priest in ancient Israel offered animals. I'm not saying that we're going to be offering animals. I'm not saying that at all. The spiritual priest in God's kingdom won't be offering spiritual sacrificing animals. It is the concept here that we want to look at. The concept of what the priest does that we want to think about. <clears throat> the priests were involved with a lot of sacrificing. So that will be the case for the priesthood in the millennium. A lot of sacrificing. How so? We're going to see. Now, keep that thought in mind. And let's go to the book of Obadiah. <clears throat> I'll take a drink while you find Obadiah. Those with you computers have an advantage. Obadiah, right before Jonah. Obadiah is one chapter. That's why it's sometimes hard to find. Right after Amos, Amos right before Jonah. One verse, verse 21. Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. Mountains, of course, in scriptures represent nations, peoples. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, notice the phrase, this last phrase, the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Back up and read verse 17. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. So this scripture in Obadiah is, a, is a, in the time frame of the millennium. The millennium, the thousand year reign of God's kingdom on earth. And he says that saviors and deliverers are going to be on Mount Zion and they're going to be judging. <clears throat> now we know that a ruler judges. But saviors are going to be judging as well. Now, keep that in mind. We're, we're, we're playing a little bit of uh, connecting the dots, if you would, here a little, there a little. Let's go over a few pages to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 4. <clears throat> keep in mind what we're being shown in these scriptures. Micah chapter 4 and verse 4. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of the host has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God. Now, it says that each person will walk or follow or operate in the name of his God. Little g. What could this possibly mean? Well, it certainly isn't talking about the Father, and it isn't talking about the Son. But the indication is that there are others who are also gods, the Hebrew is Elohim, that will have responsibility over people. That's what it says. Now, Let's turn back over to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Again, we're putting pieces together here that I think form a very logical picture when we put them all together. God has written his word in a marvelous, marvelous way. That's why you have to dig into the word of God to begin to glean from it all that God gives us. We're only scratching the surface, only scratching the surface. Nehemiah chapter 9. Keep in mind, saviors, deliverers, judging, millennium. I'm going to put that together now in the book of Nehemiah. Let's go to Nehemiah and let's just pick up verse 27. Nehemiah 9 and verse 27. <clears throat> Nehemiah is making a prayer here. That's what he's doing. He says, therefore, talking to God, 
you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppress them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven, and according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. Now, this isn't a millennial scripture, but it helps expand our understanding of our role as priest in the kingdom of God. As I said, Nehemiah is praying, and he's recounting in this prayer what happened to Israel in the past. And he's re recounting in this prayer that during this time, God, through saviors and deliverers, provided help to Israel. He's referring, of course, to people like Gideon, Samson, Joshua, Moses, and others. God gave them leaders that in turn he inspired, he directed, in order to deliver Israel from whatever trouble they were in at that time. So what we can see here as we look on into the millennium, that our responsibility as kings and priests involves the concept of saving, of judging, also the concept of teaching, as we're going to see. There are many places in the Bible where God shows us that physical Israel, the descendants of Israel in this world, they're going to go into a type of captivity at the beginning of the tribulation. We've spoken about this many times. They're going to be scattered all over the world, some type of slavery. Then when Christ returns to set up his government over this earth, they're all going to be regathered. They're going to be brought back to the land of Israel. It says in scripture that they're going to be weeping. They're going to be repentant because of all that they have endured. But then what happens? Who's going to be their saviors? Who's going to be their deliverers? Who's going to be judging them? Who's going to be teaching them? Now, we know that none of this is going to happen without God's direction and God's intervention. It all begins and ends with God, always. All praise, honor, and glory go to Him. As He completes His plan of salvation through His called and chosen and converted saints. Why do you think He's preparing you and me now? He's not going to do this all by Himself. He's going to follow the pattern that he established in the past. He is going to do it with those who are greater than these men that he used to deliver physical Israel. He's going to do it with leaders, with saviors, with king priests who are just like him, who indeed are his sons. Okay. Let's bring it back to today, right now, in our lives. Let's go over to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Have you ever noticed what James says here in chapter 5, verse 19 and 20? He's telling us something we are given to do. James 5, verse 19, says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know, the one that turns him back, that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. God's saying that we, you and I, we can turn a sinner from his way of sinning 
And if we do, we can cover a multitude of sins. So he's saying you and I right now can play a role today in actually helping to lead someone out of a very difficult sin they may be in. Did you ever realize that God has given us this responsibility while we're still in the flesh? And God's Word tells us that we have to be very wise, very cautious, very loving in how we do that. But you see, this is a priestly responsibility, as we're going to see. God is faithful. God is unwavering. He has established his plan of salvation, and he provides us the means by which he is going to accomplish it. And he's going to follow the patterns he has established in the past so that you and I can understand the kind of function that we're going to be going to play in the world tomorrow. How else would we know if we didn't look back at what God has been doing from the beginning? Romans 15.4 says, Whatever things were written before were for our learning. You're in mine. As we said earlier, 1 Corinthians 10.11 says, They were written for our instruction. For whom? Upon whom the ends of the age has come. We are at the end of this age. What we see in God's word is for us. Every bit of it. From Genesis all the way to Revelation. We can't discard anything any of it. The role of the priesthood served God's purpose for his physical nation Israel and we spiritual Israel are to learn from their examples. Let's go over to the book of Isaiah chapter 30. This is a well-known millennial scripture. But it shows us another aspect of the, these saviors, these deliverers, these spiritual priests during the reign of Christ on this earth. Isaiah 30 and verse 19. Isaiah 30, 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity, the water of affliction, notice, yet your teachers will not be moved into the corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is a way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right, the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left. So now we see another responsibility that's going to be given to God's spiritual priest in the millennium. And that's the responsibility to teach God's laws, to teach God's way of living. Let's go to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament now. We're going to see in the book of Hebrews, now I could read a long time in the book of Hebrews about this subject, but I'm going to try to just kind of pick out things to make some points. We're going to see that the Apostle Paul uses, uses the Aaronic priesthood as a type of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. It's important that we get that concept in our, in our heads. Let's just start in chapter 7 of Hebrews. Uh, let's just go down to verse 20. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, talking about Jesus Christ, for they have become priest without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the power order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant 
Okay, let's go down then to verse... Let's go to chapter 8, verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, speaking of Christ, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he, when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So God instructed Moses while he was on the mountain of how the tabernacle was to be constructed. Verse 6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. And now let's go to chapter 9 and verse 6 and 9. This is really where we want to get to. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle before performing the services. Notice that, the priest, plural. But into the second part, the high priest, an individual, went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. What we see in verse 6 through 9 even during the Aaronic high priesthood, they had priests serving under the high priest. Did you notice that? It wasn't just him. Jesus Christ, under the Melchizedek priesthood, he is also going to have a priesthood serving under him. Remember, God sets the pattern, and he follows that pattern. So both didn't serve alone. They had those functioning under them, assisting them in their office, doing things very similar to what the high priest was doing, only at a lesser, more specific level. Again, from this, we can see more of what we will be doing as priests in the kingdom of God as we see the pattern God established in the functions of the priest on the earthly, in the earthly tabernacle. The pattern stays the same. One physical, one spiritual. Continue in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year to year, make those, those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered if they'd done that. Didn't need to stop them. For the wor worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. Kind of sounds like once saved, always saved, doesn't it? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So we see that the laws of sacrifices that were carried out year after year by the priest, they were just a shadow of things to come. They were a shadow of the spiritual sacrifices that were to be made by God's spiritual priest in the kingdom of God. And we're supposed to learn from these examples because they establish the pattern God will use in his kingdom to teach Israel when he brings them back into the promised land. So I think we can begin to see that the primary function of a priest 
is to assist people in accessing God and God's way of living. This is to help people so that they can come to have a union with God. The priest does this through being a mediator, reconciling between God and men, being a teacher of the way of life that God wants man to live in order to improve the reconciliation built at the beginning of that person's conversion. Conversion is always God's doing. Only God can do that. The key word here is reconciles. A mediator reconciles. He brings together. In this case, he brings together God and men. His secondary function is that of being a teacher of the way of life that is to improve upon the reconciliation that had been established by God with that man. A priest in ancient Israel then not only reconciled God to men through offering of sacrifices, he also counseled Israel so that Israel would be able to go through the trials of life and try to maintain their faith in God. You recall we read in Obadiah, Obadiah 21 that these saviors were going to judge. We understand that God is judging us right now. Not to lose us, but he is judging us to correct us. He evaluates where we stand. When he evaluates us from this, he learns what we need, what he needs to do what we need to do in order to make our union with him better, to make it stronger. So it seems that as priests in God's kingdom, we're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to be kings. We're going to be priests. We're not only going to rule, we're going to carry out the functions of one who mediates and builds upon the reconciliation with God through teaching. What is the basis of the teaching that we're going to be using? One thing, God's eternal law. Nothing else will be taught, just God's law. Psalms 97. Psalms 97, oh, I'm sorry, Psalms 19. Psalms 19 and verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord, judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. You and I must desire to learn God's law. We have to love God's law. We do what we love, right? Yes, we do. We desire to learn what we love. Do we love God's law? It says in Psalms 119, if you want to read that, it shows us how much David loved God's law. It shows us how we should love God's law. Verse 165 of Psalms 119 says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. All you got to do 
is love God's law. What we are seeing and what God is doing is not only expanding his family for the purpose of ruling, he is also expanding his family for the purpose of being a priest. As we prepare for one, we also have to prepare for the other as well. One last scripture to wrap this up. Turn back to the New Testament, to the book of Romans. I think we've been to this scripture a number of times over the last several months. Romans chapter 12, and we're going to conclude here. Romans 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I want to change one phrase in this sentence just a little bit. Now, this isn't unscriptural because there are a number of translations that translate it this way. But it gives a little bit different nuance to what God is saying here. This sentence can be translated, present your bodies living, holy, and acceptable before God. You see, the Apostle Paul, in thinking of terms of faith, he sees sacrifice as a proper response of a converted person. That's what a converted person is going to be doing. That's what a priest does. A New Testament priest offers himself. And that's what prepares him to be a priest in God's kingdom in the world tomorrow. You see, in doing that, we will be following the example of our high priest, Jesus Christ, who was the whole burnt offering. His life was lived entirely given in obedience to the Father. Jesus Christ had the power to give his life. He had the power to take it up again. That's in John 10, verse 17. He chose to give it in order to be within the will of his Father in heaven. He gave it entirely, all of it. He gave it in death. Now, we may not be required to do that, but we are required to give our life as a sacrifice, a living, holy, like God, holy, clean, pure, righteous sacrifice that is acceptable. You see, all that Paul teaches us in the first 11 chapters of Romans, he goes over some of the major doctrines of the church. Doctrines like faith, justification, baptism, receiving God's Holy Spirit, the importance of Israel and God's plan and God grafting the Gentiles into Israel. Then here in chapter 12, he makes the crowning statement that because we know everything he covered in those first 11 chapters, and because we understand it, he says we then have to present our bodies a sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, he says that's a reasonable service. That, he says, in light of all the teaching he gives us in the first 11 chapters. He sums it up. This is what God expects of those that he calls a royal priesthood. Jesus Christ, our Savior, did it. And if we're going to be kings and priests with him, if we're going to be prepared to be with him, it's going to be because, be because we will do what he did. At our level and our ability, of course, not perfectly, 
but maybe within the framework of the gifts we have received, the amount of God's Spirit that each of us possess, and considering everything in our individual lives, it will be perfect in terms of what God can expect from each of us individually. God is very practical in what he expects of us. And we can do it because God wills us to do it. We have to be willing. God expects us to turn the knowledge that he has given us, and he's given us so much. He expects us to turn it into practical, ethical applications in our lives, in our jobs, our marriages, our relationship with our neighbors, our relationships especially with one another. Everything, everything, especially our attitudes. Our attitudes which drives everything else that we think or do. Think about that. Attitudes drive everything else that we think or do. Undergirding all of this is that we sacrifice our life in a living sacrifice because we believe what Christ has taught us. We are preparing now to be priests in God's kingdom. We are desiring, desiring with our whole heart to offer ourselves as priestly sacrifices to God's service in the ways that he is teaching us and as we will teach in the world tomorrow in God's kingdom. God is preparing us now to be kings and priests in his eternal family. Let's start learning.